So I'm Beth Engelbrecht. Um, I will be facilitating the first um, part of this webinar, and then Sue Cleary will take over from me. So just a word about SALAD. Uh, so this is a learning alliance with the sole purpose of uh, strengthening the, the, the district health system in, in South Africa. Um, so we are made up of a kind of, it's a really an alliance of people in districts, provinces, national uh, health uh, officials, but then also of NGOs, um, uh, and then also a range of health, health, higher education institutions, a range of um, universities involved, especially those with schools of public health. And the, the main purpose is then to form a partnership for, for learning. And kind of the reason why we've established with the focus on the district health system is that, look, all of us know that the president is signing or have signed uh, the NHI bill into law. And that very clearly um, emphasizes again the important role of the district health system and management at the district level as the units of governance and innovation and with a place where uh, primary health care is being delivered. So uh, our focus is then on to set to have a range of activities um, and themes for DHS strengthening like uh, service delivery, governance, leadership, human resources, but then also health financing and health policy. So that is then also the context why this topic was uh, selected um, about resource management. Um, and the focus then is on to recognize that the system uh, is, is there's a lot of demands on the system and there's continuously new demands coming on. And how do we navigate resource management in an area where there's economic downturn? Uh, where there's such a lot of demands and where difficult decisions have to be taken. Um, and we know that financing and budgeting have been long-standing complexities, yet very often the capabilities um, uh, and, and the, the kind of the support to the front line at the district level very often require further attention. So this webinar on, on district financing will be uh, the first one um, of finance in the financing and budgeting space. Um, a further one will be later on in this year, and the focus will be on resource allocation for equity, and kind of equity conversations, resource allocation, etc. So today it's about capabilities, it's about what, how do we navigate, etc. Um, and uh, I would like to particularly invite um, everyone on the call uh, to please use chat. Uh, that the time for direct engagement will be limited. So please um, use chat. I want to see a lot of activity on the chat. Whatever resonates with you, what learning you take, something that you would like to contribute that you think is going to be um, very useful um, in, 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 in the learning process of everybody on the call. And ultimately, we would like to see you know, what type of strategies and activities would help to strengthen the district health system uh, from a financing perspective. So uh, we've got so the 90 minutes of our um, webinar will unfold as follows. We will start with two district voices. Uh, the one will be Odwa Sagoni. He's the director of finance at the Amatole district in the Eastern Cape Department of Health. And then the second one will be from Deneo Morimani. She is uh, formerly the acting chief director for the Kenneth Kaunda district and currently just recently started the Acting Chief Director for Hospital Services in the Northwest Province. So you would see that we try to get a range of provinces involving in these webinars so that we can hear voices from different spaces and different contexts to really inform, uh, inform our learning. So after these inputs, we will unfortunately not have much time for discussion and questions and so on. So please use the chat for that. So Lucy Gilson um, will be watching the chat and she will then give input in her synthesis from what's happening in the chat. After that, Sue Cleary, I will hand over to Sue Cleary to facilitate the, the next part of the, the webinar. And she will then facilitate a panel discussion. And you can see there on the screen, the panelists is Simon Kay from the Western Cape Government and Health, Health and Welfare. Uh, he's the CFO. And then also Mark Bletcher, who is uh, from National Treasury. And then Tulani Masilela from 
uh, the Department of Performance Management and Evaluation in the presidency. So uh, Sue will then kind of facilitate that conversation to, to kind of for the panel to respond to this. So it's really my honor to um, introduce you to the first speaker, Odwa Sagorni. So Odwa, um, the, the brief, let me put it this way, the brief to the two speakers at, at district level was for them to indicate, indicate to us um, what are the type of resource related decisions that you have to take? Uh, who do you work with? What strategies do you employ to work collaboratively with other people in your teams, but also outside of your teams? And then what are the personal resources that you draw on to be able to take to make these uh, resource uh, decisions? So Odwa um, is the Director of Financial Management at Amatoli. Um, he's, he's got a BCom degree and is also a chartered accountant. Um, and he ended up in, in health when he was in a private firm uh, to do audit improvement plans in the Eastern Cape Department of Health. Um, it was a very challenging space, but he was then able together, and at the time Simon Kay was the CFO um, at, at, at the Eastern Cape, um, and ultimately they, they changed the audit findings around uh, from audit uh, disclaimers and adverse audits to ultimately get an unqualified audit opinion a few years later. And they could maintain that for two consecutive years. So um, he kind of very much re realized the, the work-life balance that's needed. Um, and he's kind of very often in the gym and he spent family time with his three children. So Odua, I'm gonna hand over to you. So please, uh, thank you, Zianda. We can then move on to, to Odua's presentation. Thank you, Odua. All right, good, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, uh, Beth, for the introduction. But let me correct one thing. I am not a chartered accountant. I received <laughs> all the blessings. <laughs> as as I would, I would I would love to, to to have become one, but unfortunately not yet. But let me move straight to my uh, uh, presentation. You can help. You will help me with the with the moving on of the presentation. Beth, please. I will go straight to the presentation outline, which is going to talk to the background as as you have table uh, labeled resource related decisions we make and support, as well as uh, decision makers and principles of decision making strategies to work collaboratively, and then personal resources we draw from. Uh, on the background, uh, should I uh, uh, get my video going, or is it OK if I, I remain? OK, all right. Um, as the head of finance uh, 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 and SEM within the district, we are responsible for managing uh, finances of many cost centers, being the district office, four sub-district offices, 14 hospitals, as well as five community health clinics and 142 clinics within the district. Uh, and then there are two deputy directors that report directly to me, the one for finance and one for SCM that we work with in the district office. And we the, the allocation of the, of the budget to these cost centers is done provincially. We don't have a say as to how much goes to each facility per se. And in the current financial year, we are presiding over a 1.9 billion you can move the slides back. We are presiding over 1.9 billion uh, 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 worth of budget uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the current financial year. 82% of that pay salaries, and we only have 18% going to goods and services. As at end of March this year, we are sitting with a total of 195 million as, as accruals from last year. So of the 18% that we work with, 55% of that has to settle those accruals first. And that leaves us with a 45% uh, to, to, to run the services this financial year. And uh, the, the biggest culprit for our financial woes is, 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 is said to be the medical legal claims that uh, we, we grapple with in the, pro, in the, in the, in the country. So that, 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 that's the main major, major, major cause of why we have such financial uh, difficulties. And then moving on slide, uh, and the next slide, which is the resources related decisions we make and support. Uh, we have to make uh, budget related decisions for the benefit of all our facilities. Uh, and the budget allocation for the district, especially on goods and services, is, is always not enough, as you have seen in the previous slide, it's not enough. So we have to, 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 to think hard as to how are we going to use the available resources you know, efficiently. 
What we have done as a district uh, recently, we have started to cluster our facilities per district. In fact, cluster the budget as well. So for, for, for a certain cluster, the budget allocated in that cluster will be used by all facilities within that cluster. We have found this strategy to have created a bigger pool of, finance, of, of funds for us to be able to work instead of an institution funding for itself. We can move to the next slide there. Uh, and then one of the other decisions we, we, we have to make, uh, or we have had to make, is to decentralize uh, functions to facilities. We would love to have our facilities independent, you know, run their own procurement and, and, and payment systems and procure their own goods, you know, but there are challenges with that, with that, with that, with that, with that approach, because now it means that there must be efficient resources that are deployed to those facilities. For instance, um, you need to have a, a staff finance officials in each facility to be able to, 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 to also achieve segregation of duty imperatives, but it's difficult because of the shortage of staff that we have. And we have a result, have challenges in decentralizing fully. Another thing that contributes to us not being able to decentralize is uh, a, 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 what we've picked up that people, you know, end up embarking on unethical conduct in our facility. So you can't trust you can't trust them enough with those functions like paying, creation of an order. Those are serious, you know. If people abuse those, you you, you find yourself dealing with something else. And we have had such instances as, as, as a result. We are centralizing some of the functions so that we can keep control, you know, like the pre issuing of an the issuing of an order remains I, I saw, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Can I continue? Please do, Odwa. All right. And then let's move to the to the to the to the another slide. We have a uh, uh, the decision makers and the principle of decision making. We have various structures within the district, you know, that are responsible for the decisions that we make. We have a, a provincial cost containment committee which comprises of the executive management of the department together with various program managers. The function of this uh, committee really is to is to is to is to is to evaluate procurement and payment requests as well as managing the cash flow of the department in its in its entirety. And then there's a district management team, which is a, is a district committee that sits, that comprises of CEOs of facilities, you know, heads of sub-district offices. And we sit on a monthly basis to also consider various uh, issues within the district. And then we have a district budget advisory committee meeting, which sits on a monthly basis as well, to consider budgets for all institutions within the district. And then we have you've a got, district... You've got two minutes, Odwa. Oh, two minutes already. Okay, and then these committees link uh, uh, both, uh, you know, with the with the with the with the, with the PCC, and then uh, how do we make our, our our decisions? We use data, the district health expenditure reviews. We have the DHIS system that we also use to 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 look at uh, to support our decisions that we make in terms of the funding, and then how do we work collaboratively? Uh, we work, you know, with 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 everyone in the district. Uh, and we, we 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 try and be consultative in our approach with the meetings that we hold. You know, with the meetings that we hold, we do a, a, a work collaborate with all the district. And then the personal resources to navigate the demands of the job. Well, the audit background that one has has made it a, a really possible for us to navigate through a very challenging en environment within the district. And also being able to interpret financial information really has helped, you know, to be able to hold a conversation with a doctor, for instance, when they are requiring their clinical, you know, requirements and when we are able to, 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 to share ideas there. And also being surrounded by a hardworking team, really, I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would mention that that also assists us in making sure that we navigate through all the decisions that we make within the district. Well, I hope I have covered everything in the, in the, in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Odwa. And I know to put this together in such a short time with all your workplace pressure is so challenging. I wonder whether the team can perhaps just show us the last slide just for us to note, uh, I think, all the personal strengths that um, that he, that he um, is navigating. So, yeah, thanks, thanks for that as well. So I'm uh, moving then on to uh, Deneo um, is the further speaker, the district input that we've got today, the voice from the Northwest province. Um, and Deneo um, is a nurse by background, 
um, and she uh, she started off her bio to say that she's a mother of two beautiful girls and she resides in the rural area of, of, of Northwest. So she's got postgraduate uh, training in health service management. She also did other training courses. She was a nursing service manager, a CEO of hospitals and a director of district hospital services. Now she is. She was the acting chief director for Dr. KK, Kenneth Kaunda District in Northwest Province um, until recently, um, and then has moved to now be the uh, acting chief director for hospital services and the nursing college in the Northwest Province. But that was only recently, and we could draw on her experience um, as uh, the kind of a person with a district as a district manager level. And we've asked her the same brief um, in terms of reflecting on her experiences of navigating resource management. Over to you, um, Deneo. Uh, thank you, Prof, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to take you through on what we did and Dr. KK to navigate uh, the limited resources that we had. Uh, my presentation covers uh, what we did, uh, the definition of why we are here and understanding your environment. We, I also covered the strategies that we implemented and the personal resources that we draw from that, as well as the conclusion. Now, when you look at the definition of a uh, health care resource are defined, that's in the next slide, are defined as all personnel, funds, facilities, equipment, legal frameworks, policies, regulations used in managing healthcare services. And effective management of the above is critical to ensure that the best possible care is provided, ultimately improving health outcomes. This includes, but is not limited to clinical governance, financial governance, recruitment, and personal capacity building. Now, the first thing that you, one needs to do is to analyze the environment in which they work and analyze the stakeholders there. We have internal and external stakeholders. We are working with private sectors, business sectors, local government, the labor unions, the support partners, and other government department. And internally, we have a HR unit, uh, we have the supply chain and finance. We have the departmental management committee. Uh, we have the health professionals, the clinicians that we, we are working with. That's in the next slide, Prof. And what we did, we the first thing that one needs to do is to understand the environment in which they work. Uh, we, we prioritize, you ident analyze your stakeholders and prioritize them. Uh, the department did not have a contract for procurement of diesel. Thus, diesel was procured on quotation basis. Due to the level and intensity of load trading, the procurement was frequent and mostly done on an emergency basis. Diesel was procured at 54 rand a liter because we know people who take advantage. Skills for identifying opportunities for optimizing resource allocation was then utilized. And we also use our problem solving skills, wherein we then utilize, effectively utilize the available budget to cover the cost of diesel over the MTF period. Because we know, uh, we, we, should we run short of the budget, we are not going to get anything or we are going to struggle to get something from somewhere. And discussions with the local business partner uh, to determine the cost of procuring on bulk were embarked on. We used our negotiation skills to get better prices for the district. And we were persistent. We had a persistent attitude to the point that we reduced the price to less than 50% of the initial price. And we also used our in network of relations in the provincial office to solicit the support for developing a local SLE. Now, for us to get to this point, we, we, we went into uh, creating a very big vision for, for the district and making sure that everybody within the district understand that. Uh, next slide, Prof. It, uh, our vision was uh, our tool or our goal, our tool which we use to make sure that the people that we work with understand that we do not have enough resources to, to start using them uh, ineffectively. We created a very big vision and we communicated it. And our vision was we are a world-class district. Now everybody wants to put on the world-class performance into the district. 
Now, the strategies that we used there, Prof, we, we, we did a SWOT analysis. Uh, one of the things that we also were struggling with as a district was teenage pregnancy in one of our subjects. We did a SWOT analysis, and we then all identified that we've got an opportunity to collaborate with partners. We uh, The existing intergovernmental collaboration with uh, DOE, Justice and Social Development, to cap the teenage pregnancy in the area. We used the 5Y methodology to determine the root causes of teenage pregnancy, and we engage stakeholders uh, to uh, use of, uh, we use our communication skills there. Because at some point, you can imagine having to uh, gather parents and tell them that your children are sexually active. They need to start using contraceptives. We walked in the wood with the parents discussing use of contraceptives and see tops with them. And we focus on our data. Our decision was based on what we have in the in our data, in our registers. And we use this to uh, roll out the AYFS services in Makwasi Hill using available, available skills and capacity, wherein one is trained and no longer rendering services. We were we, uh, recalling them back to that service. And we implemented snowball methodology as well. Every success that we realized, we were celebrating it. And when you get into the next slide, we also use the control knobs framework. Uh, we, we have a number of control knobs framework, but I'm just going to, to get into the next slide and, and highlight how we use the resource allocation control knob to get our facilities functional. Uh, some of the previous health posts in JB Maxab district had no structure as they were turned into eight hour facilities. And in order for us to continue rendering the services, they were allocated one professionalness. And this was not always uh, user friendly because if one falls ill or is absent, then it means the service get discontinued. In order to continue rendering services, uh, uh, we, we analyzed the district vacant and funded post. We knew we are not going to get additional funds from anywhere. So we went into the district, looked into where we have available funded posts and that are vacant, and we utilize them to uh, augment staff in our eight hour facilities. And we use these posts attached to other facilities and relocate them to the eight hour facilities. We did not start sitting down and saying, let's request additional funds because we know we are not going to use this. We again use our network of relationships to negotiate with the organizational development unit to support the initiative. And we use the financial control knob to effectively make sure that the available resources are, are, are fully utilized. Now, two minutes, one, two minutes the nail. One, next slide, one has to have a, a different number of personal resources. You need to be self-awareness, being rooted, especially in your religious belief. If, if you need to sit down and say to your team, let's pray, you do that. It's what you believe it works for you. It will assist you. And you, you want also to balance your work and personal life. Be available at all times, uh, as this also assisted most of us in, in, in making sure that whenever clinicians call, they, we are available. Strong work ethics and discipline. Uh, when you, you, you have to go and negotiate the price of petrol, diesel, if, if you are, you, you need to make sure that you don't get corrupted. Uh, in the process. A positive and tenacious attitude wherein you have to be persistent in getting this. Supportive network of relationship, cultural competency and diversity awareness, and problem solving skills and decision making skills. Make decisions, make decisions. When they are wrong, you have made a decision. The person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the one doing it. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Teneo, um, uh, for uh, excellent uh, examples that you've given us and how you pulled on your skills. So let me just quick kind of just extract particular thoughts from this. So Altwa spoke about a system under severe stress uh, with a 81% COE and 55% in the accruals. They sp he spoke about the innovation that they've done to pull resources and decentralization and have structures for decision making. And then he also highlighted the various uh, tools that they've used. But the enablers uh, have been collaborative work, good relationships, having technical competencies um, and a way of making decisions and then also have a team approach. So thanks for that, Odwa. 
from Deneo, she spoke about kind of a vision-led interventions where she felt authorized and supported to negotiate with external stakeholders at the district level for a, a discount and a local um, uh, agreement. Um, she spoke about the teenage pregnancies, the issue of relationships, collaboration, the various tools of five Y, snowball, control knobs, and then particularly the personal resources of self-awareness, spiritual maturity, work-life balance, work ethics, cultural competence is such a brilliant point, and also relationships. Thank you very much to the two of you. So, Lucy, um, I'm going to hand over to you to just share with us what is emerging in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. And again, thanks to Odwa and Dinea. So really coming out in the chat are some of the, is the importance of the relationships as one's managing um, the hard resources, the soft skills that are not so soft to work with people and through people being um, seen as very important. Um, and uh, Sue, drawing on her own experience outside of the health system, emphasizing also the importance of personal resources and people you can draw on as a leader to support you in, in taking those tough decisions. And uh, Danae, I thought really, uh, both Danae and Odwa really emphasized the importance of the personal resources to be able to um, navigate resource management. Um, Renelle's just chipped in in the chat peer support and learning from others, so important. And of course, that's one of the things we hope that this webinar will enable as well. So Beth, a, a few points from the chat and back to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and you know, we gave the speakers only 10 minutes each and you can see they've got so much to say, uh, but so content. And thank you very much for that. I see the is also coming back. Yes, relationships management is very important and one has to tread carefully. So clearly relationships seems to be those soft skills. Very often we think the hard skills is the only thing that, that and actually soft skills are hard. Okay, so this is now my privilege to introduce uh, Sue Cleary. Now, she's introduced on the program as Susan, and I was wondering if her mother was angry with her, she would call her Susan. But That's clearly, it. we fondly refer to her as Sue Cleary, so uh, it is really my privilege to introduce Sue. So Sue, Sue is the uh, director of the... Um, uh, the uh, let me just quickly get that uh, the head of the department and the professor of health economics in the School of Public Health at UCT. Uh, she's the, the director of the school. Uh, she's got a PhD in public health and a master's in health economics. Uh, she did her a PhD in if, uh, equity and efficiency in HIV treatment. Um, and her focus areas is equity, priority setting, and UHC, universal health coverage, very useful and important in, in uh, wherever we go. Her strengths lie in methodologies of economic evaluation, um, and she's involved in teaching health economics at the postgraduate diploma, master's, and doctorate levels. So it's really a privilege to have you here. So I'm handing over the facilitation to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Beth, and a very uh, warm good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And I was going through the the names that I see before me, and it's really wonderful to see the names, at least, of some people that I've known for a really long time. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to ask our panelists to please unmute themselves and turn their videos on, if possible. So that's Simon, Mark, and Tulani. There we go. Thanks, Simon. And Mark, we see something. There you are. And there's Tulani. So we have an amazing panel um, for the second part of today's session. And um, this includes Simon Kay, who's the Deputy Director General of Corporate Support Services in the Western Cape Department of Health and Wellness. Mark Bletcher, who's the Chief Director for Health and Social Development at National Treasury and Tulani Masalela, who is the Outcomes Facilitator for Health at the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation in the Presidency. Thank you so much to the three of you for generously sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. So um, my job is to, to facilitate a discussion between the three of you around uh, this question of resource management at the district level. So drawing on your experiences, which are wide and far ranging, um, the questions are from your position, what do you judge enables or challenges effective resource management? And how can 
provincial and national level actors better support district managers to make difficult resource allocation decisions. So I think um, I'm just going to um, ask you one by one to give an initial thought in response to those questions. And then we're basically going to see how it goes. So I'm going to start with Simon because he's, he's sort of on my screen first. So Simon, over to you. What are your thoughts? No, thanks. Thanks, Sue. And uh, a very good afternoon to everybody. Um, so Sue, I I looked at the, I broke it down maybe into the, 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 the two elements. The one is around the enablers. And the other one, I think, is around the challenges. And and I listened to, there's quite a lot that what Udra said resonated with me because I think some of the enablers are around the culture, having a common purpose, having a shared vision, having an aligned and aligned values. Udra spoke about trust and not being able to do certain things because there is this lack of trust. Because with that comes maximal decentralization of capacity and therefore maximal decentralization of decision making now that enables that enables what 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 disenables or disenfranchises people is centralization of authority um <clears throat> the the fact that we are in a health department or in a health sector and therefore uh, a disproportionate uh, ratio of resources allocated to healthcare professionals and therefore not to the support the support teams and and odd we spoke to that and then i think fundamentally we have to in a health setting have an abundant mindset um we are forever complaining that we don't have enough we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough this. We don't have enough that. But but we've got to move away from that because that will that will set us free. We have an enormous amount of resources that are sitting in in the health system, and if we can use those together and pull those, that moves from a challenge into an enabler. Thanks. I love that abundant mindset. Uh, we we'll have to talk about how we get there. Blame I love that. <laughs> Mark, what are your thoughts? All right. Okay. Um, greetings, colleagues. I'm actually quite delighted to, to be able to even put on my camera because I've been in bed with flu for about the last five days. So um, today my fever came down for the first time. So thank um, you. So I'm feeling very happy to actually be able to even be able to talk in a way. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yes, we can hear you. All right. If I can speak a couple of comments. So Firstly, thank you to the, to both speakers. I thought I thought they gave really uh, great uh, inputs, and and I think that it also you know raises for me the question of you know to what extent are these kinds of experience say between district uh, managers being shared? Still, do we still have a working district uh, committee? Certainly, as a as the treasury, we haven't really heard from the district uh, kind of you know, the coordinating district committee for many, many years. And so we don't hear these kinds of voices because I think many of the points that were shared are, are really, really important. So, so a couple of issues. So, I mean, we, we've we um, been part of publishing the district health barometer every year for the last decade or so. And we, we write that section on finance in the barometer. And what we find in it, what we describe every year, one of the things we describe is the inequities between districts. So we show, so we show, show the spending in each in each district and per capita and per, per head count, et cetera, and what the national norm is and the provincial norm, uh, sorry, average and, um, and, and how far each district um, varies from that. So they're quite big inequities between, between districts. And... Um, that relates also partly to a point that Odwa made quite quite well or quite strongly, where he said that they receive their budget from the province and they have actually fairly limited power into it, and basically they it just gets given down to them. And it sounded like it's even given down to them specified, say for example, by facility. I'm not sure if I, if I understood that correctly, but. Um, <clears throat> 
The first question for me is, how does one make progress on addressing this inter-district uh, inequity? So one of the proposals around that has been um, some kind of inter-district allocation formula, and that's been going around for, for quite a number of years as a proposal. Shivani Ramji is a, actually did some work on a formula for an inter-district allocation formula. Um, Simon can talk more about the Western Cape pro uh, progress with that, but my understanding is that they were fairly close to, to implementing some of the work of trying to get, um, using some kind of formula-based approach to get more equitable inter-district allocations. But certainly there's an arbitrariness in the current allocations between districts, um, which is there something we can address on that? Um, secondly, I just want to talk uh, briefly about system issues. So the ability to know and control your spending, and I was impressed by the things that Ottawa uh, was saying about this from a finance side, that he's got, you know, he's got a finance team and a procurement, a procurement team, supply chain team, and they're able to do this, that, and the other. So that's that's good at the um, at the district level. Um, but many across the country, and it may be even in their districts, many many primary care facilities, for example, are not even on on the system. So they're they're not on the BAS uh, as a as a spending uh, cost center. And even when the team that does the district health um, a barometer, um, um, the data behind it, often it has to it has to kind of collect data, data from a number of different spending sources because often they're not fully um, consolidated within BAS under the district cost center. So the way that the way that um, the way that provinces design um, and districts design their their cost center structure under BAS and the importance of having the relevant centers, uh, districts and sub districts and facilities um, on the system is quite important for the ability to to even know what is being spent at at, at these levels. Let alone coming on to the next issue, which is the actual uh, power to spend. And I mean, Audra raises an interesting debate, which I don't want to get into into detail now, but there's been a lot of, um, for example, complaints, can I call it, or unhappiness from facility managers. Say if you had a clinic or you had a community health center, that they have no power to manage their facility uh, they can't run their facility as a as a cost center. They have no power to do anything. And the approach that um, Audra was saying, where actually they 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 seeing some problems in facility based management, and they actually have had to pull back powers from quite a lot of their facilities and run it either at sub district uh, area. And remember that we also in the NHR bill, there's this concept of the cup, which is effectively the the sub district. So. You know what is the where does the one want to put the balance of of these powers between the district, the sub district, and the facilities? But that that's an important area of of discussion. Now I I, I don't want to go on because I, I've run out of time. But if I could just mention several other things I have on my list here that I would have spoken to if I've got more time. So, um, so one on the establishment of districts. Give it as an independent independent status. This was supposed to happen under the National Health Act, but it never really happened. I'm not sure if that section ever got promulgated. The bill makes provision for 53 semi-independent district government components, but there are quite a lot of obstacles to that happening. It'll probably take quite a number of years. The bill also suggests that these semi-independent districts will shift from Nash from provincial to being under national which you know, has got a lot of potential problems around that, but that, that's an area for potential discussion. The district management structure as well, uh, which the colleague spoke to, there's a lot of variability across the different districts on the spending on the management structure itself and what should be those structures be and the relative uh, at district and sub-district. And then how do we in the interims, as we start moving closer to NHI, start in a sense, contracting with districts, uh, even perhaps through the provinces, because it's going to take years to do it through the funds. So we should probably be doing it through the provinces for quite a number of years. 
So to what extent could one move to capitation-based or other formulae for funding districts, for example, say through provinces for an interim, say five years, for example? And then within the district or the sub-district or cup, what progress needs to be made on contracting there, for example, on capitation with facilities or general practitioners or other kinds of, of contracting options? But anyway, uh, sorry, I've run a bit over time. Back to you, Chairperson. Thank you so much, Mark. So some really, um, so we definitely need you to come back to future webinars. And I think the issue of, of capitation, the issue of equity um, between districts and sub-districts and, and how one enables that and the, and the information systems needed in order to know what we spend and how well we're doing in that regard are all really, really valuable points. So Tilani, um, from your position, what do you think enables or challenges effective resource management? And, and how do you think that you might better support from your position in the presidency? So over to you for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sue. Uh, let me also thank my two colleagues from the Eastern Cape and the Northwest for the presentation. And also to say that um, I think Simon and Mark have said a mouthful, which also enables me to be brief. Um, in terms of enablers, you know, our department uh, located in the presidency has been crisscrossing the country, uh, visiting provincial departments of health and uh, districts over the last 11 years of its existence. But also before that, in the 10 years I spent in the Department of Health, I was doing more or less the same thing. One key enabler, I believe, is that there's recognition uh, amongst the provincial offices that the capacity and capability of district, ma district health management teams has improved over the last 30 years. So we are not today where we were like three decades ago. So that improving capability and capacity um, are, being, are being recognized. Um, and the second thing is that with that it has come increased decision-making space. I think as the recognition of capability has happened, these DMTs and district managers have also been given more authority and more uh, decision-making space. Now, what we have found to be challenges, you know, the, there's a, a, a top-down and a bottom-up perspective on, on this. And the top-down perspective comes from provinces, which believes there are still gaps that need to be plugged, despite the improvements that we, we have seen. And part of this is the, part of the reasons we are given is the high staff turnover, you know, that yes, we've been building capacity, but some people have left or new people have come in and some talents have been lost and so forth. And then the second issue I think has been touched on by both Odo and Simon is the issue of trust. And there's still a trust deficit between districts and, and provinces. But my two quick points, and I'll conclude. Um, I want to say that during moments of crisis, such as COVID-19 and the cholera outbreak, we have seen more trust being placed on districts. District health services, meaning including the leadership of the district managers and the district health management teams. More trust has been placed on their capacity to carry the country through difficult moments. Now, the question becomes, why do we trust them during moments of crisis? But we don't trust them when the situation is normal. Or maybe we don't trust them adequately when the situation is normal. So I think th that becomes one of the key challenges. During moments of crisis, we also see you know, uh, management team, district management teams being allowed to make uh, makeshift structures to compensate for gaps in infrastructure, accommodate more patients and compensate for gaps and so forth. So that's um, one area I believe we should focus on. The second one is the cost of district health services versus the budget and expenditure. A lot has been said about how you control the budget, how do you control the expenditure. But what we don't admit often is that, you know, actually the cost of providing district health services is either unknown or it's not well documented. 
So what you are talking about is the given. You know, you've been given a budget so much of so much and you manage it this way. But what is the actual cost of providing those services? That's the second one. What we can do at national and provincial level, I think um, it relates to the issues of cha I've identified as challenges. One, continue to develop capability and capacity, therefore enabling us to place more trust, but also not look at the historical and incremental budgets, but begin to grapple with the actual cost of providing um, services. I, I can pause there, I was just adding to what my colleagues have said, thanks. Thank you, that was that was awesome. Um, and, and following on with the sort of positive mindset, which I think is what we really need to do, if I were to summarize across the three of you, I would say the first thing is this idea of abundance. We are in fact well-resourced. We do in fact have, have money. Um, secondly, that district management has improved in the past three decades. And that is something that we should be talking about more, that actually things have gotten better in the past three decades. And thirdly, that there is still room for improvement in terms of equitable per capita allocations between districts. And there is an opportunity um, in the current moment with the implementation of the NHI or irrespective, to be honest, there is an opportunity to use various funding formulae and, and data to seek to improve that equity. And, and I know that there is experience in that regard. Uh, another interesting point made by Tulani is this issue of us having not costed district health services yet. So we know what the budget is and we are able to track how that changes over time, but we don't actually have an idea of what it would cost to provide a particular benefit package. And I think that that's, that's a good point. And I think that that's, that's something that the academic community should should get in, involved in, in helping. Because of course, once we cost it, we'll probably find that we, we can't do everything that we would want to do as per usual. And then we would need to make decisions. Those hard resource allocation decisions would still be there. Um, so that's um, a brief summary of what I've heard so far. But I'd just like to pause for a moment and come to ask Lucy, who's been monitoring the chat for us, to summarize some of the key points that are coming through from the chat. Over to you, Lucy. Thanks, Sue. So uh, I think in the chat, there's been a continuing uh, set of points around the importance of trust and relationships in, uh, in, in, in managing resources, which I think you know, raises the question of how as we introduce quite hard incentives in the system, what's going to be the consequences for trust and trusting relationships? Um, and linked to that, Herman earlier on made a very interesting point about um, that unethical management at district level, uh, decentralized level, is, is relatively easy control, relatively little money gets stolen. But as you centralize and manage budgets more centrally, um, that may cause more problems in terms of, or may, may create more opportunities for um, loss of, uh, of resources. Uh, Danae has picked up on issues around uh, centralization and decentralization. And I think we have to remember that it's not just budget or resources that are centralized. It's also delegations for human resource management in some settings, um, which impact on your ability to navigate resources. Um, and then finally, again, points coming through about data and the lack of, uh, of uh, the limited available data and joined up data um, to, to manage um, resources. Back to you, Sue. Thanks so much, Lucy. So panel colleagues, um, let's move now into uh, another question, um, although if you do feel that you had more to add on the previous questions, I will totally understand. But the next question that we asked you to reflect on is the question of what one to two key lessons can we take from the current experience of resource management at district level for future health system development? And of course, NHI, I think the bill is now an act or it was signed today. So um, please feel free to link it to the NHI developments. Um, so what one to two key lessons can we take from the current experiences as we seek to further strengthen resource management at the district level? So Simon, I'm gonna to come to you again as the first person, thank you. Thanks Sue. 
So um, yeah, I, I kind of put it in, in in three three questions. So I'm going to combine a couple of things and answer a couple of questions that have been asked. Okay. So I think I think in in my engagements with facility managers, sub district managers, district managers, CEOs, they've asked for a couple of things when it comes to resource allocation. The first one is fairness. Let's see that we are getting our fair share. The second one is inclusivity. Please include us in the conversations around arriving at the decisions. Let's recognize that there are inequities in this country and let us um, uh, 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 recognize the, the equity, equity elements. Let's be transparent. So even if we don't like what's going on, let us at least be in it and be be honest about the decision that you've had to make for whatever reason and the direction that you sent us in. And then the please can we have some level of incentivization? Um, and not perverse incentivization. So the example here is in 2019, the definition of the PHC headcount was changed. And therefore, the PHC headcount came down. But the strategy in the country had been to advance community-based outreach services. So we weren't seeing people in our facilities. We were seeing them in their homes, which is what you want. But we get penalized because our PHC headcount has come down. And that's that's something that's very real. In the equity space, if we are efficient, please don't penalize us for having savings while somebody else is being inefficient and you are rewarding them by giving them our efficiencies because of their inefficiencies. And so that then links to something that Tulani said now, you don't know this yet, but I'm coming to talk to you about a resource strategy for health. Because I see it in three spaces. I see the first space is the resource allocation. So it's like your sales. It's the money that you're going to get. The second element is around the expenditure, what you're spending your money on. And the third element is around how do we leverage other resources for the public health benefit. And we tend to mix those things up and, 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 and merge them without looking at them in, 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 with, with specific, specific lenses. Um, Mark's right. So in the province, we've taken the work that was done in the provincial equitable share uh, formula revision. And we've started to implement something called the ERA, which uh, we will talk about at, 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 at another webinar, which is the equity resource allocation, which tries to start taking cognizance of what equity is and how different geographical areas have different factors in them. And it amends the resource that you allocate on the top, not the expenditure that is being incurred. It lends itself nicely in the primary care level to a capitation model. And I think actually, Tulani, we're not too far away. We could go and try and cost the service benefit package to the nth degree. But I think we'll trip ourselves up. And I think we'll end up going down rabbit holes that we don't necessarily need to go down. So I think there is there is enough evidence to show me that a capitation fee will work. But in the district hospitals and any hospital component, that capitation doesn't work because it doesn't measure acuity. Um, and so the, 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 the modality of allocating resource into the hospital component of the district uh, 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 health uh, 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 programs is 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 a is a bridge that we haven't quite 
uh, got over, and that becomes more and more complicated as 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 we work up. I think also at a central level, there's a couple of things that we need to do. We need to provide strategy for an organisation. We need to provide a set of common principles that we all aspire to, whether those are principles, whether those are values, but but we need to all be uh, aspiring to those things. We need to be able to provide tools so that everybody has access to the same tool. And we need adaptive M&E. Now, M&E is used as a stick and it is an inhibitor to us being able to do a whole lot of things. So we really have to become very adaptive in our M&E and we have to move away from hundreds and hundreds of indicators that make absolutely zero sense to the uh, uh, to 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 people that are rendering a service at, at the front line because we're being funded for things in certain ways. I, we really need to move away from, from, from that quite carefully. The last thing is in our own organization, we've been grappling with the, the calm agenda um, around being connected, aligning, learning, and making the doing. And, and at a head office level, at a macro level, whether that is at a provincial office or at a national office, you should really be avoiding the making bit. You should be providing the connectedness and the alignment and allowing for learnings to happen so that we have nuances at the, uh, the, 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 the lowest level that people can be adaptive to the needs on the ground. Um, and that's something that we we are grappling with in 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 our own space. So um, yeah, I spoke a bit, but thank you. I've now finished all my notes. Stunning! Thanks so much, Simon. There was so many points there that were really really interesting, and uh, and I think that um, there are a few points that can be picked up by, as far as I can tell, picked up by by Mark on um, the primary health care. Uh, the headcount and how that feeds into the provincial equitable share. And if I'm not mistake, mistaken, there are also some points that can be picked up upon um, about hundreds of indicators, whether or not they are sensible or senseless, and how one can um, move into, did you call it adaptive monitoring and evaluation? So some really nice little points that um, the others might be able to pick up on. So thanks so much for that. So Mark, what are your thoughts? Okay, um, hi again. So I, I just want to make three points. Um, the first one is, you know, I, I think it is quite important for us to, in a sense, um, almost like settle what is the primary unit of spending analysis that we want to focus on. And if we're going to focus on the district as a as a key level, um, in a sense, you know, I think we need to stick with that and build with that. So for example, if if we accept that in the, the NHR bills um, cup approach, the cup is not actually a stat, that's the subdistrict, is not actually a statutory, it's not going to have a statutory function in the same way that the district is going to have. So it's not going to have its own financial statements and staff and all that kind of thing. So it's more going to be, it's more going to be the district kind of in a sense almost supporting or kind of running, if you can call it that, um, you know, a couple of sub-district cups. But the key power is going to be in the district and less so in the province. If we, if we kind of see it that, that the district you know, is an important uh, role, as uh, Tilani was saying, that, you know, it has actually built up some trust and it's, and, we, and we want to see it as building up more trust and more powers. So if that's the route we're going, you know, I think we need to, we need to, in a sense, um, um, move forward with that agenda. Because it means that we need to make sure our financial systems show all the spending by district. For example, the spending is going to be captured there. The staff have got to be captured on per cell with the, you know, there needs to be district codes on them. Um, and a lot of other things have to be at the district level. And a lot of decisions, like, for example, um, what Audra was saying around, well, it's just the provincial head office that actually makes the decision on our budget. You know, it's got to happen less like that in future. 
got to be much more budgeting from the district. So if one's going to go the district route strongly like this, one's got to reinforce a lot of things in the period ahead to, to back that up. Um, the second thing then is that, and linking to Simon's point about the headcount, so the headcount debate has led to a, a vacuum because there's currently no agreed set of kind of key health sector performance measures to link to budget because there's just the perception that headcounts are insufficient. Yes, we should probably add, you know, community health visits, school health visits, and one or two others, but there's no sectoral agreement on the the, 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 the mix of those uh, indicators and how they should be linked to, to financing because those obviously have different unit cost structures. So, you know, we need to kind of solve that because at the moment there's no agreed way of linking. If you're going to have a, a funding formula that links um, funds to performance, then we need to agree on how, you know, the, the performance measure is structured. That's the second point. The third point then is if we have if we're moving to NHI, which inherently in NHI involves contracting or strategic purchasing, and in the interim, um, you know, the province is going to be playing still a key role for many years um, in, in, in that relationship between a more stronger district, um, um, then the province needs to start thinking about strategic purchasing or contracting so that the there is also the case of formula farming is talking about maybe a linear formula or whatever, you know, is linked to some kind of contract. And so, yes, the district is getting more, more independent and in decision making power, but it's going to be linked to like what is expected from the district, not just a hundred like random indicators, but it's more kind of a you know, performance based contract. This is what you know, we're giving you 200 million to your district, but this is what we are agreeing jointly your district going to you know, produce. And it's, and it's, so it's a more kind of strategic purchasing approach. Um, so how do we restructure that relationship between the province and the district um, in the next say, three to five years? Obviously, you know, ultimately that may, amends somewhat as the NHI fund gets going. But um, if those if those patterns of strategic purchasing are well developed and uh, and uh, um, provincial to district arrangements will really help to set some of those frameworks much better in place. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, so just to highlight one key point that you're making around the head the headcount debate. And so colleagues, as, as, as I might be a little bit wrong about this, but my understanding is that the headcount debate links into the health component of the provincial equitable share formula is, is that the case? And so it is actually quite important <coughs> that this performance measure is something that can be agreed upon. And what I'm hearing from Mark is that there is no sectoral agreement on, on what should be used in that formula. So it's quite a technical discussion, but certainly very interesting um, from my perspective to, to hear these debates. So I'm going to move now to Talani's thoughts on these issues, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. So again, uh, I agree with a lot that uh, both Mark and Simon have said, and that also assists me to spend less time um, speaking. First, um, there are two areas in our policy making in the health sector which we need to overcome. The first one is short termism, and the second one is the flavor of the month approach. So the, the short termism is this, you know, narrow focus on what needs to be done over the next 12 months, uh, if we are lucky, 24 months or 36 months. And I'd like to support what someone was saying about developing a strategy and common principle principles. Because a strategy by its very nature is not a short term issue. It's a medium to long term issue which enables us to achieve our goals. So maybe this um, short-termism is also influenced by our APPs being one-year plans. And um, yeah, also that our budgets are linked to APPs, but not directly to district health plans. Um, that's one area that needs to be looked into. The second issue on this flavor of the month approach is that we have abundant tools 
that have worked well in the past. And I think Simon also touched on the issue of, of tools. So we had, and I think uh, both uh, Professor Cleary and Professor Engelbrecht led the work around district health expenditure reviews. And it was done consistently and there was good, good data that was coming through. The second issue is that of the equity gauge. And I think uh, both my co-panelists have touched on the issues of, of equity. And maybe in a modern way, uh, since the health system continuously modernizes itself, we need to find a way and a, and a set of tools for us to continuously track issues of, of equity. Equity can't get out of fashion. It has to remain a, a priority going, going forward. I, I agree um, with my colleagues on the issue of the definition of PHC. If you, if you take the PHC headcount defined as visits to health facilities, physical health facilities, you will say our PHC headcounts have increased from 68 million in 1998 to 121 million in 2022. But if you take the broader definition, which includes community-based services, that number increases to 138 million. And there's a very nice slide that uh, Mark Bletcher presented uh, last year based on data from NDOH, which shows across all service delivery platforms how we, we, we end up at 138 million. And I think as you were saying, Chair, to say, what do we then factor into the budget allocation formula? Do we, end, do we factor in the narrow definition, 121 million, the expanded definition, 138 million, and, and so forth. And using either, you will come up with a different um, set of figures. So yeah, I think in summary, I, I agree. I want to make one last comment. Um, still being at the union buildings now where the NHI bill has just been signed. The issue of the coexistence of district management teams and the DHMOs as envisaged in the NHI Act now is going to be very, very critical because if we are to achieve efficiencies, equity and improvements in the quality of care delivered, we can't have structures at district level falling on top of each other, performing the same functions, whereas talent and capacity could be better utilized elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. And I'm enjoying the picture of you sitting at the union buildings, having watched the signing of the bill, and hopefully we're <laughs> going to see photos of you in the media. Um, so, so thank you so much for those, those in points. Um, ah, in points. <laughs> inputs, inputs, and the points that you've made, and just to highlight one that really was that I really like, which is that we need both a way and a set of tools to track equity. So, so really, for me, tools, yes, and I'm a big fan of tools, like everybody else. I love me a nice spreadsheet and so on and so forth. But what's coming through here is the importance of the culture and the relationships as being absolutely essential to, to finding a way of actually using these tools in a way that can enable greater equity. So thank you so much for those, those inputs from all of you. It's been absolutely fascinating from my perspective. Um, Lucy, I know you've been sending me some messages and things, but uh, I've been trying to keep track of multiple things. So perhaps I'll hand to you and, and see what you're finding as, as key coming from the chat. And um, perhaps you want to invite some people to speak. Sure. Yes. Thanks, Sue. So uh, there's been some great comments in the chat. And I wondered if it might be good to hear from a couple of voice, voices that we haven't heard from so, so far. Um, so, uh, um, Herman, you've made some good points. Would you like to contribute uh, at the moment? Elisma, you've made some, um, when I say good, interesting points. Would you like to contribute? Can we call you into the conversation? What are your current thoughts? And then maybe we can ask Odwa and Dineo for a last couple of comments. Um, Elisma, you were right the first time. Good afternoon. Excellent. Um, <laughs> um, <coughs> Thank you, guys. This is a most interesting and invigorating discussion. And um, it brings me to one of my, uh, let's say, pet things, the idea of disease profiling. Because 
if we don't know what is happening in our communities, how do we even begin to budget? Because um, it, then, then it's thumb suck to begin with. And then I think um, what stood out today was, um, and we've talked about this many times, the importance of relationships, um, the importance of looking innovatively at how we spend money. I loved what Odwa said in his talk about clustering budgets, which then release actually more money than what an individual institution um, have, and that you can just think differently of how the resource allocation will be. Um, and then the very important point that many of um, the speakers have made, and also in the comments, um, the importance of data-driven decision-making. So I think those are the standouts for me today and um, some wonderful take-home messages from Simon. I will need to chew and reflect on everything that he said because there is just so much that it is impossible to take in everything in a moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elisla. That's great. And Herman, you should be able to unmute and speak. Are you are you able to do that so we can hear your voice? Seems that we may be having some problems there. So, um, uh, Sue, perhaps I can just um, turn to Deneo and Odwa and ask them for last two very last brief comments before I hand back to you. Deneo, would you like to go first? Last reflections. Yes, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, once more. The, the importance of collaboration. I, it's it's very important for us to collaborate with sectors within our our vicinity. In each almost every second town, we've got med med clinic, med uh, all these private hospitals. They have so much that they can offer to us, which we are not uh, uh, utilizing. They 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 can provide BLS and ACLS trainings, which we can piggyback from them and be able to expand what the limited resources that we have. And this cannot be overemphasized. And relationship management is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Danao. And Odwa, one last thought from you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, bro. Uh, I think Dineo hit it on the nail, really, because what Mark mentioned earlier that, you know, we are no longer visible as districts, you know, uh, the information is, is always coming from the provincial side and the voice here, down here, is, 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 is not quite loud enough, you know, even the reports that are coming through. And another point that Mark mentioned that resonated well with me is the fact that the bus system in, 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 in facilities, the way we have structured our reporting is that you don't really see the, 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 the impact of each cost center, you know, in the system. And that is due basically to the, to the resources that are there in those facilities. There's no one, for instance, in a clinic to run the system. You know, those nurses, they battle even to, to procure a window pane that is broken. They have to go to the sub-districts, you know, sometimes to the district for them to just uh, replace a broken window. So those things need to be looked into so that, you know, facility managers that are down there are able to just do little things. But having said all of that, we need to take into cognizance the controls that should be in place so that people don't buy a window pane for, for 2,000 rands. Because those are the things that we deal with where people, once they're given such power, they start to, 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 to take those dubious decisions. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you so much, Otwa. So um, I feel the devil's in the details, Sue. Back to you. <laughs> and I was going to say something very broad. So uh, thank you in particular to the all of the speakers that have um, shared with us today and um, to the panel um, for, for really sharing your wisdom and for stimulating our discussion. So if I were to summarize a bit in terms of what I've heard and linking it to a framework that we often use in academia, there is this idea of of um, 
need, needing to have appropriate hardware. So those are things like your abundance of resources, so your abundance of budgets, as well as needing the tools in order to make these decisions. So, so having information systems that actually provide you with the information that you need in order to make a good decision. But in making those decisions, one needs to very much rest on the software of the system. And that will be things like the extent to which we can collaborate, the extent to which we have trust, whether we are clear about our vision and whether we know what the values are that we are seeking to live by. So the principles and the values and, and very, very intentionally seeking to manage our relationships so that we can continue to, to move ahead and to achieve greater levels of equity. And, you know, just saying from, from my sort of small perspective um, in academia of managing quite a large department, it's not easy to make progress towards equity. And there are many traps along the way and difficulties and people don't like change. Um, and so definitely what one, what, what one needs is these relationships and this trust and this collaborative mindset to be stimulated around a common purpose and a common vision. So that's that's those are the main things that came from my side. And then also just wonderful um, to, to learn more um, from different perspectives. And so I think that that's mainly from what I would say. And I will now hand back to Beth um, to have the last words. Thanks, Beth. Thank you very much, Sue, uh, and thank you for uh, your facilitation of the session. Um, clearly, the, the first part of the webinar was quite rushed uh, because we've put pressure, and it's very clear that the, the, the voices from the district stimulated a lot of thinking, um, and we, we saw a range of proposals of where we can invest and what the system needs to be stronger and better. And what's interesting is that the issue of relationships and trust came out so strongly. Um, and then the issue of where and how can incentivization uh, stimulate those type of skill sets than kind of those hard stuff. So clearly, I think there's a lot of discussion required. Herman, uh, you've got uh, perhaps one minute, if you don't mind, just to share your input, um, if you can unmute. I can unmute now, but I need to say I've said a few things. I think that's all. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So just from my side also, uh, uh, just a word of uh, acknowledgement. And I think, uh, Caressa, you could put that slide on, um, on, the, on the screen. So this is just to acknowledge uh, the two district inputs. You know, I, I've seen how hard these two district colleagues worked on their slides to make it very succinct to make it answering the, the type of briefs that they've received and work late at night to get that in this way and that way. So thank you very much for that. And also to kind of be rushed into a 10 minute input, uh, you are really, really very good. Uh, we really appreciate the time um, and the contributions. And then to Simon um, and Mark um, and to Lani, um, you were kind of uh, selected <laughs> to be panelists uh, because of your capabilities and your vast experience and the contributions that you can make to a debate like this. We really appreciate your time. We know that everybody's diaries are so pressurized um, and, uh, and, and really that, that is something that we do not uh, take for granted. Um, so, so we, uh, apart from that, uh, ultimately you can see on the screen now we had, um, 304 registrations, uh, and I think those who attended were about 78. Uh, so clearly our reach were exceptionally good. Um, not everybody ultimately joined, uh, but clearly we've learned a lot about how to get the message out. So that was well done. But thank you for the attendees, for your listening, for your contributions in the chat. It's really excellent to, to have that. And then the salad webinar design team. Um, thank you to Sue and to Lucy and Helen. Um, and Simon was part of this team as well. And then the technical support from Caressa and Zianda, um, uh, keeping, the, keeping us accountable, keeping us on track and working on the technical aspects. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, 
And in the logos on the slide, you can also see uh, how many universities and partners have been part of, of the SALAD team um, to be able to take things forward. So clearly, um, UCT School of Public Health, uh, very involved in, in, the, in the driving seat at the University of Western Cape, largely driving this process, School of Public Health. Um, and then the Northwest University also has an input. And then obviously uh, Simon was very instrumental in shaping our thinking. Um, and then Sue also in terms of uh, the, the, the health economics unit. So thank you very much for every one of your contributions. So going forward, um, so the, the recordings uh, will be made available and we will also make a brief summary. So you'll be able to get the recording um, at the YouTube channels of both UCT and UWC. Um, and then we are looking at um, future webinars. We try to do them every two, two months, more or less. Uh, we recently had one on the DHS. Last year, we had one on austerity. Today, we had one on district financing. So going forward, we did indicate that somewhere in the future, we will have one on equitable equity and resource allocation. Um, and then there are very topics that also emerged um, in the chat today. So we will definitely take that forward. And then the, the webinar, the SALAD team will reflect on those uh, and then craft out how do we approach future webinars. But you can see this is not to end up with a to-do list of so many things to be done. This is really just bringing minds together, talking, looking at the priorities. We, we believe, and it's so, that the district is the unit of governance and, and innovation. It's the vehicle to deliver primary health care. Um, and as a solid team, we try to navigate a learning alliance and mechanisms uh, to, to get that going. So, so there are a few mailing lists, uh, the PASA uh, listserv, and also SALAD. If you want to join SALAD, it's free. You don't have to pay anything. Um, just a, a message Caressa. Um, and then we also uh, want to say that we are um, at the moment busy with the SAMJ series on the district health system um, and on the the, the, the list surf also from HST. We are also having communication and conversation. You can see that the SALA team is really <laughs> putting their heads into the district health system to make sure that we can add the value uh, for growth and yeah, to, to improve health in our country and strengthen leadership and management and yeah, everything to, to for people who want to make decisions that they are unable to do so and to build trust and relationships. So just from my side, uh, thank you to every one of you who participated. Um, every, everyone's role was so crucial today, and we look forward to, to join you again um, in, in one of our future webinars. So from, from me and the whole salad team and the design team, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, just goodbye from my side. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bay. Thanks, Thanks Bay. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. 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 bye.